It's unbelievable. It makes our whole week. Right now, actually, we haven't ran these numbers in like six months, but six months ago, there were 2,900 cities tuning into Legacy in 90 different countries. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. So thank you guys all for being here this morning. All right, can we get rid of that little mm, that gospel ring in the back of my mind? Amen. All right, so the title of today's message is uh, Where You Go, I'll Go. And it's kind of a carryover from yesterday. You don't have to be here for yesterday to understand today, but this is going to be some of the most practical information regarding heaven on earth that I could ever offer you. Is that all right? Okay. So I want to tell you a little bit about my family dynamic before I jump into this message, because this message is about covenant relationships. The family that I grew up in and the family that I have now, I've learned that biology doesn't mean much. All my siblings are his, mine, and ours. So you guys know what his, mine, and ours are? Steps and halves and all of that stuff. And we learned really fast that blood isn't that important. Yep, my brother and I have been brothers since we were three. <laughs> three stepbrothers, whatever that stupid word means. Right? But if somebody fought him, they had to fight me too. Amen. Right? We, we knew how it went. As a matter of fact, we both have these really stupid little scars on our pinkies, and we had one of our teachers convinced that we were born conjoined. Amen. Yeah, he's a lot better looking than me, but we can't. <laughs> it lasted a while. But listen, this is what I want to show you. Okay, so, so God values covenant over biology. My mom and dad aren't my mom and dad because I share blood with them. Okay, I do share blood with them. They happens to be, but they've been great moms and dads. Okay, my, my biological sister, Mandy, treats me like gold. She's in covenant with me. My brothers, my sisters, they're in covenant with me. We learned quickly that biology doesn't mean much. I have the best relationship that a father and son could ever have with my sons. We learned quickly that biology doesn't mean much. And you realize that that's actually a kingdom concept. That's actually a kingdom concept. Have you ever heard the terminology that blood is thicker than water? Did you know that Easterners meant something different when they came up with that saying than Westerners understand it to mean? Westerners use the term blood is thicker than water to get you to be faithful to a biological relative that's not in covenant with you. I'm your brother. I don't care. Yep. I don't care. Right? You're my brother because you chose to be. Yep. The fact that we share blood doesn't give you any special privileges. Get it? I'm not trying to go here, but this is what I want you to understand. When Easterners said that blood is thicker than water, what they meant is that the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Amen. Yep. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. And that origin actually had a derivative earlier than that. Is it was that blood is thicker than milk. The blood of a covenant between two people that choose to be in covenant is thicker than two people that nursed at the same breast. Share the same mother. Right? So... God, incarnate, emphasized covenant over biology, okay? And this isn't about covenant over biology, but I want you to feel good about the people that surround you that are there for you, okay? Jesus was in the temple, and his mom and brother said, hey, will you get him for us? And he said, I'm busy with these people. Who are these people? He said, who are my mothers and my brothers but those who do the will of my father? People that were in covenant with them by choice, right? So that statement that blood is thicker than water, it's usually to get you to come to Thanksgivings that you don't want to go to, <laughs> right? It's to get you to be loyal and allegiant to somebody that's done nothing to invest in your relationship, right? Covenant relationships are the relational foundation of the Bible. We're in a, a series right now called Heaven Here, Heaven Now. And what we recognize about Jesus' ministry is Jesus actually focused on the mundane over the overt. So we have, I mean, we see it here, healing, dead raising, deliverance, like those things are a blast. But Jesus didn't emphasize those. As a matter of fact, most of Jesus' teaching was regarding what we would call covert ministry, the mundane things, the way that you treat people, the way that you handle your family, the way that you love your wife, the way that you settle disputes, the way that you handle offense. Those things are the things that Jesus emphasizes over what we would call overt ministry, the public declaration of the gospel, raising of the dead, healing the sick. Those things are massively important. 
But if you don't have a covert culture to support your overt ministry, that's where hypocrisy is birthed. I've seen you raise the dead, but I haven't seen you forgive your offender. Right? Nobody cares about that. When Paul was talking about spiritual gifts, he said, if you can prophesy with the tongues of men and of angels, but you have not love, you're like a clanging cymbal. Right? So your gift doesn't make you a Christian. Right? So you can all settle down off the pressure. Your gift doesn't make you a Christian. Your Bible says, by this they'll know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. Yep, so it's not even your piety towards God. It's not your prayer life, your willingness to fast, or your ability to raise the dead. It's the way you treat your fellow human being. It's that simple. So when, when you're in a covenant relationship, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make kind of a distinction here. When you're in a covenant relationship, that means that you're in the relationship not from, for what you can get out of it, but because you've chosen to be. It's not even what you can contribute. We use a term for, for relationships that are outside of what we would call covenant, and that's camaraderie. Camaraderie is what destroys local churches. Camaraderie is what destroys local churches. Let me show you what camaraderie looks like. And I'm going to give you the baptized version of camaraderie. Right? There's a baptized version of camaraderie that sneaks into the local church and destroys it from the inside out. Camaraderie is when you're friends because of what you're for or what you're against. Camaraderie is what you're, when you're friends because of what you're for or what you're against. When your cause goes away, so does your relationship. Yep. When you're in covenant with somebody... My brother owns a business. We, we run a ministry. We're busy people. We don't get to see each other enough. Six months can go by. and be like, bro, I need help. He's like, Zhoo! at my house. Yeah, why? Because we decided that when we were three. Yeah, we decided that when, my, when we were three. My sons, they can never do anything for me to not be their dad. Ever. Ever. Get it? So in camaraderie, you start forming these bonds that are based on what you're for or what you're against. Like there's the club that thinks the music's too loud. There's the club that thinks the music's too quiet. There's the club that likes the lead guitar. There's the club that doesn't like that I'm wearing a hat today. <clears throat> you're like, shoot, it's been like 20 minutes. A boy called me out already. Listen, but what you realize is no matter how bad you want that to feel right, it'll never feel right. When you're gathered around what you're for or you're against, as soon as the cause go away, your relationship evaporates. And you realize you actually have to get unbalanced regarding the cause in order to keep the relationship going. Right? You run into each other at the food court at the mall. You're like, I need something bad to say to this person. You think I sound funny, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Our relationship's based on complaining, so I need to find something that we can mutually dislike. Hmm. How about that administration? Right? And you just have to find something to tear down in order for you guys to feel built up. Right? That's not heaven on earth. The way that heaven on earth conducts its relationships is that you're in the relationship because you chose to be, period. And once you choose to be, you're in it forever. Yep. And you can start a relationship because there was some kind of mutual benefit, but here's the deal. Once that benefit goes away, it determines what kind of person you actually are and what kind of relationship you've actually committed to. Yep. How many of you are familiar with Ruth, Orpah, Naomi? You guys know these people? Okay, Old Testament ladies. Naomi had two sons, and they both married two ladies. Those ladies' names, ladies' names. We're in Ohio. That's okay. <laughs> What's Yin's names is again? Okay. Their names were Ruth and Orpah. I'm going to read, a, read uh, about them to you real quick before we get into the theology of this. So if you go to Ruth chapter 1, you're going to start in verse 1. I'm going to show you a perfect example. It's like a cross-section of what right relationships should look like. It says, It came to pass in the days of the, when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of the two sons were Malan and Chilin. Uh, a big word of Bethlehem. Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left, her two sons. Now they took wives, the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth, and they dwelt there about 10 years. 
then Malan and Chilion both died also. So the woman survived by her two sons. Excuse me. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. So Naomi's got two boys and a husband, right? She has a family, biological family. Then her husband passes, followed by her two sons. So this woman's alone, and all she has left is two daughters-in-law, right? Not biological, covenant. And then Naomi gives them the opportunity to leave the relationship because she believes that their relationship is based on what she can get out of it, based on camaraderie. She says, even if I had kids today, would you be willing to wait for me to get you a new husband? Why are you connected with me? What am I doing for you that's worth you being connected to me? Now, this is what I want to show you. I'll read it to you in context so you can get it. It says, then she arose with her daughters that she might return from the country of Moab, and she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return to your mother's house. Okay, so what did Naomi just try to do? She tried to ditch the daughters, right? And her desire for ditching the daughters is actually kind of a noble desire. But it's only because she didn't understand what kind of relationship her daughters-in-law were in with her. It says this. Go return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as he has dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you might find rest in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, surely we will return to you with your people. Now, I'm not trying to make this like personal. I'm not trying to make this practical, but... Both of them say the right thing at first, right? Both Ruth and Orpah say, no, we're going to stay with you. Then Naomi pushes back one more time, and she says, turn back, daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I'm too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons. Would you wait for them to be grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to be with her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Okay, so what happened? They both said the right thing initially. They had an opportunity for a falling out. Both of them said the right thing initially. Orpah was testing the waters. Ruth was telling the truth right? Ruth's name in Hebrew means friendship. So Ruth literally, by God's demonstration, is what friendship should look like. She was demonstrating covenant relationship with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Orpah's name meant gazelle. Yep. What do gazelles do, y'all? They runners. Yep, they're runners. They go from relationship to relationship to get what they need from it. Once it's not producing anymore, off they go, springing and bounding into the distance, off to the next thing, right? There are friends and there are runners. You will, (laughs) they will be displayed by the type of relationship that you're willing to have when there's nothing to be gained. Are you with me? So if, if the context of this entire passage, if the context of this entire sermon is how you and I can display right relationship on earth as it is in heaven, then we need to take cues from this. We need to take cues from this, right? You have friends. Let me put it this way, because I want you to get self-righteous. You're a friend or you're a gazelle. You're a Ruth or you're an Orpah. You're a stayer or you're a goer. Right? Here's the thing. Going is completely foreign and it's devastating to stayers. Going is devastating to stayers. Because friends don't understand how friends could leave friends. Right? Right? You see everything through your own lens. So when you're in in covenant commitment to somebody and they walk the other way, you're like, what the heck? Right? It doesn't make sense. 
It makes no sense. So God's idea of relationship is demonstrated in the Old Testament in the book of Ruth. Ruth thinks they're in the type of relationship that requires some kind of mutual benefit to stay friends. The language that we use here is that I'll take a bullet for you, which is very easy, by the way. That doesn't make you, that doesn't make you pious. Right? I'll take a bullet from you, is the second half, and never leave you. Right? Friendly fire is common in the local church. Do not think that you will ever be part of a local assembly where you don't take shots. Yep. People have bad days. People have bad days. But the relationship, when you see it as forever, is more important than the moment of pain. Make sense? Is it good? Can we talk theology? Can we put some spiritual components to this? Okay. We are going to have uh, some ministry time at the end, um, so I won't be super long-winded. But I want us to understand this concept. And this is, this is what I want to understand. But this is what I want us to come to understand the most. When, when Jesus talked about becoming the manifest image of God, he said things that were very practical. If you do this, you'll be like your father in heaven. So oftentimes, we're waiting for deliverance or we're waiting for divine intervention, or we're waiting to be, become better disciples, whatever it might be. But what God is waiting on is maturity, participation, and choices. Like, if you forgive those who spitefully use and persecute you, and pray for those who offend you, you'll be like your Father in heaven. If you send rain on the just and the unjust, you'll be like your Father in heaven. So these aren't things that you need delivered from or delivered into. These aren't holy, inspired spirit moments. These are just choices that you make to be like your Father in heaven. Moses demonstrated what this looked like in the Old Testament. God actually approached Moses and said, hey, I've got an idea. You and I, we're tight. Let's kill everybody else and start over. Most denominations would take that invitation in a half a second. <laughs> Most denominations would be like, God, I've been thinking that for years. <laughs> Moses says, God, no. You let us out of bondage, and if they see that you let us out of bondage to kill us, you're going to look bad. Yep. Saul, who later became Paul, he persecuted the church beyond measure. That was his own confession. He was on his way to take them captive and bind them and put them in prison at the chief priest's instructions. Right? Right? Then he converted out of Judaism, became a, a New Testament apostle, and the most trouble that he had and the people that inflicted the most pain on him were Jews. But Paul said that if it be possible, he gladly would have his name blotted from the book of life that his own countrymen may be saved. Do you know what he's trying to say? Take me out, bring them in. Yeah. Take me out, listen, bring them in. You ever heard a confession like that before? Yeah, the incarnate Godhead. The incarnate Godhead. Do this, be like your Father in heaven. You need to make choices regarding your friendships. You need to make choices. You need to evaluate your friendships. Now, I always have to go here because you don't have to be in covenant relationship with everybody. One of the most valuable lessons my wife and I have learned is to be able to identify the type of relationship we're in with people. We're in covenant relationship with some people. We're in a mentor relationship with other people. We're mentees of some people. And we've decided who we're going to do life with forever. We've decided who we're going to do life with forever. And here's the thing. Covenant, covenant requires both parties agreeing. Yep. So sometimes you think you're in covenant and then you find out you're not. Understand? Good? Okay. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. No, forget that. Hebrews chapter 12. Go to verse 18. It's you, it says, You have not come to a mountain that might be touched with and burned with fire, 
and to the blackness and darkest, darkness and tempest. And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, if it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come, this is talking to you, right? But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Okay, so, so this is talking about your current resurrected reality. So he just gives you a perfect depiction of what you would see if you looked around from the throne. Ephesians 1 and 2 says that you were raised and seated with him above every principality, power, might, and dominion. You sat on the throne with Jesus at the right hand of the Father. If you take a look around, you'll see each other. The church of the firstborn, the spirits of just men made perfect. Some of them have bodies on earth, some of them don't, but they're all gathered in the same place. All right, that's some theology we don't necessarily have time to get into. But here's the deal. You become a disoriented person when you're judging the people in your relationship by their actions. Right? That is not the orientation that you are called to have. You are called to be oriented from the inside out, from the top down, meaning that this reality is the reality that governs how you see each other. When Jesus approached the Pharisees, his accusation against the Pharisees was, you judge according to appearance, I judge with righteous judgment. So when you start judging the people you're in relationship with based on appearance, you're no longer oriented from heaven down. You're allowing them to tell you who they are rather than God. Okay? You can't stay in right relationship that way. Your relationship will only ever be as good as it's going. How many of you know that's exhausting? That's exhausting. They took two hours to text me back. They didn't return my call. Like... I get that. Get some communication standards in your, in your relationship. It's, it's okay to do. But it doesn't change who they are to you. Yep. And it's exhausting being in a performance-based relationship. Yep. Not to pick open anybody's scabs, but if any of you have ever been married to a narcissist, you know. You know. In a relationship between a narcissist and a codependent, the narcissist is happy if the narcissist is happy. The codependent is also happy if the narcissist is happy. Yeah, it's bad news. The codependent, exhausted, exhausted from trying to make sure that they don't drop any of these plates that they're spending to make the other person happy. Yep, that's not covenant. That's not marriage. That's not marriage. Good? Okay, so you have come to Mount Zion. That means you have been oriented with a new reality concerning your fellow human. And if you've been oriented with a new reality concerning your fellow human, that reality now has to govern your relationships. You don't judge according to the appearance. You judge righteously, meaning what you look around and see from the throne has to be the, the, the foundation that your relationship is built on. Eyes like fire, hair like wool, feet like bronze, right? V, my granddaughter, told me that my hair is getting to be like wool. She put a little finger right here and goes, it's turning white. Uh -huh. Yep. It's distinguished. Right? And my wife thinks it's hot, so I keep it. <laughs> All right. What did I tell you to go before Hebrews 12? 1 Corinthians 3. That's it. Okay. So check this out. How many of you enjoy being part of a revelatory community? Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Right? You never know what you're going to get. Yep. Being part of a, of a revelatory community is actually the fruit of being un, in union. The apostolic teaching, check this out. I get to take the credit for it, but you guys are actually the forerunners for it. Apostolic preaching is a reflection of the union that's found in the body that's being offered to. Paul said he becomes all things to all men. So the, the level of his preaching was actually determined by the people he was speaking to. He said, some of you I can only feed with milk. I wish I could cut up a T-bone for you, but you're not ready. Right? So the fact that you guys get T-bones week after week says more about you than it does about me. Get it? You should applaud yourselves for that. That's good news. But check this out. 
Paul's apostolic responsibility required him to make sure that he was feeding people things that they wouldn't choke on. And he knew if they would choke on them before he fed them based on the relationships that they had with one another. It was simple, right? You can either act like an oriented spirit being that has been raised and seated in heavenly places and sees one another according to the spirits of just men made perfect, or you're a disoriented human being that walks in judgment by appearance. If you walk in judgment by appearance, guess what the fruit of that will be? Envy, strife, and division. Envy, strife, and division. Yep. Do you know there's... Uh, yeah, never mind. We won't go there. Churches fall apart over envy. Churches fall apart over envy. Churches fall apart over strife. People, <laughs> churches fall apart over division. Gathering around what you're for or against. Yep. Good? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says this. He said, brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual people. Right? Apostolic father desires to teach deep things to his kids. He says, I cannot speak to you like spiritual people. I have to speak to you as to carnal, like babies in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you're not able to receive it. Even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal. Wrong orientation, right? For where there are envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? What he was able to teach them was determined by their relationships with one another. Envy, strife, and division is the product of being a carnal person. A carnal person just simply means that you judge by senses. That's it. You're governed externally rather than be, being governed internally. You allow people's actions to tell you who they are rather than allowing God to tell you who they are. Yep. So one of the, hmm, one of the things that we talk about extensively in the academy that we don't talk about very often on Sunday morning is the, the, <laughs> the, the inclusive nature of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I want to make this make sense to you. Okay. So sin had a consequence. Sin, the distortion of humanity, had a consequence. The consequence was death. Okay? Athanasius said, God cannot make himself a liar to preserve us. So he has to kill us. Yep. If he lets you live, then he makes himself a liar. Because he says that in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. So rather than allowing us each to die individually at our own time, he brings us into himself as a federal head. He's the last Adam, and your Bible says, as in Adam, all die. So everybody came into him and died death with him. It says, you died, and your life is hidden now with Christ in God. That's Colossians 2. Okay, so the death that was required of you already took place. You were co-killed with Jesus. And when you were co-killed with Jesus, he also raptured you into his resurrection and sat you at the right hand of God in heavenly places. That doesn't happen when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That happened on Calvary. You appropriate the benefits of being included in his death, burial, and resurrection when you believe. So this is what you need to understand. All of humanity was raptured in his resurrection. Okay? No matter who you're looking at, they have a resurrected state, whether they're aware of it or not. So you being mature are able to sidestep envy, strife, and division by treating them as a person that they don't even recognize that they are. Okay? This is, I don't want to say this is the problem with the church. That's my least favorite line in any sermon. This is the problem with the church. I don't like those sermons, but check this out. Okay? If you're a carnal person, all you have is senses to judge people on, right? And before you're in the church, it's either that person's a jerk or they're not a jerk, right? And then once you get in the church, you baptize your judgment. And then it's that person's a Baptist, <laughs> that person's a Pentecostal, that person's a Mormon. Whatever we see on the outside is what we determine they are on the inside. But us judging them by their faith statement is just as bad as us judging them by their works, right? Right? So now, 
We've graduated into the second heaven, which is where soul lives. Now you're led not by sight, but now emotions. How many of you know you can baptize emotions to make them sound spiritual? Yep, they're not. I've got a bad feeling. Maybe you're just super suspicious. Right? D by the way, discernment is a gift. My wife walks in it. It saved me. And I've not listened to it, and it's hurt me. Discernment's wonderful. Okay, but discernment is the beginning of intercession, not the end of a decision. Okay? If God gives you the gift of discernment, it's so that you might edify, encourage, and comfort the person you're discerning, even if you're discerning something that's less than. You're discerning what they believe about themselves, not who they are. Right? So if you're no longer a carnal person, you don't have a carnal perspective. It says, those who are carnal seek those things which are below. But those who are of the Spirit have set their minds on things above. So your mind is literally focused on who somebody is in the resurrection. Even if they don't know it, your maturity makes it your responsibility. Get it? You sure? You still mad about my hat? Still mad? Okay, first heaven churches. This will make all your life make sense. First heaven churches are only concerned with outward appearance. Right? That's why you wear a three-piece suit. That's why there's no hats. That's why the women don't wear makeup. That's why body parts in ministry are really important. Some of you caught it. Some of you didn't. First heaven churches oppress feminine ministry. God ordains female prophets. Get over it. <laughs> okay? Then we graduate, and now we're no longer fo focused on outward appearance. Now we're focused on gifts, callings, and anointings. That's where apostles, like ooh, prophets, those are fantastic. God has an expression of your God-given identity in every heaven. You have a gift, calling, and anointing that you're called to walk in. Okay? But that is not what makes you you. That's why Paul didn't ever, ever introduce himself as the Apostle Paul. That's what we call him. He said, I'm Paul, an apostle. Yep, it was his name, his identity, and then his function. His function wasn't his name. Yep, Tommy holds more authority and carries more weight than my apostolic office. Yep, so then we graduate. And now we're seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places. And the inclusive and sufficient sacrifice of Jesus brought all of humanity with him, past, present, future. The works, check this out. You want theology? The works were finished from before the foundation of the world, okay? So that means somebody's birth is their incarnation. It's not their beginning, okay? So they've been, they are, or they will be. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yep. Do you get this? We're talking about community, not this deep stuff. So all Paul had to notice in order for him to, to uh, what do I want to say, withhold Revelatory content was that they couldn't get along. That's it. That's it. Jesus looked for union where, when he looked for somewhere to teach. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, probably like the most significant teachings that Jesus ever had. The all of, well, that's not the all of it discourse. The Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, he looked for a group. Yep, you're not a building on a hill. You are a city on a hill. Yep, you don't get to stand alone. Yep, you're the salt of the earth, all of you collectively. We don't get to do this alone. So when it comes to relationships, the only indication that Paul needed to determine whether the community he was speaking to was mature enough to receive his revelation was how they treated one another. There's a difference between carnal community and spiritual community. Carnal community is trademarked by envy, strife, and division because carnal people cannot build healthy community. They're always selfish by nature. The natural mind is always searching for a community that will satisfy them. The carnal mind is always looking for the community that gives them what they need. Okay. Any relationship that is based on getting needs met is temporary. That's why they make you swear that if you can no longer meet your spouse's need, they can't leave you. While you're standing at the altar, it's the first thing you have to say, for better or for worse. Yep. If I'm worse, you got to stay. Because they don't believe in the sanctity of 
covenant relationship. Good? Almost there. In a spiritual community, relationships are based on covenant, not camaraderie. Covenant says, I'm with you until we die. Friends that will take bullets for each other and from each other. If your relationships are carnal, they are by nature self-seeking, and you only participate in to the degree that you can get something from it. If it's based on covenant, you participate, to, excuse me, you participate in it to the degree that you can offer something to it. Spiritual communities are spirit-led. They're not carnality-governed. You guys good so far? You sure? Okay. So, practicality. You have decisions to make. It's that simple. Maturity, participation, choices. I'm in a relationship. Somebody offended me or disappointed me. What do you do? That's when you get to be like your father in heaven. Yep. You don't need somebody to lay hands on you so you can get through this trial. No, suck it up. Be like your father in heaven. As a matter of fact, one of the only things, the only conversations that Jesus refused to pray for his disciples when, was when they asked how to forgive somebody that offended them. Jesus taught them to raise the dead. They went and raised the dead. Jesus taught them to heal the sick. They went and healed the sick. Jesus, they asked Jesus how many times they should forgive their brother. He said 70 times 7. They said, whoa. And they said, Jesus, increase our faith. And he said, no. He literally said no. He said, if you're a servant and you make your master dinner and get him a drink, are they going to say, well done? No, they're going to say, you did what you were supposed to do. Like, this is Jesus teaching. This isn't me saying this. He said, so when you forgive somebody, you don't even get a congratulations. Like, minimum expectation of the forgiven is to forgive. Minimum expectation of the forgiven is to forgive. How many have ever flown before? Okay, there was one year that I flew like, I don't know, 32 planes or something like this. This year's probably going to top that. And I remember on like the fourth or fifth flight, they landed the plane and everybody started applauding. That was the most terrifying moment of my aviation life. Their applause indicated to me that there was another option. An option that I never considered. <coughs> you ever see those new TikToks going around, new fear unlocked? Yep. That was my day. You, you don't even get a heavenly applause for forgiveness. It's just the minimum expectation. Now, because I feel somebody's asking this question in their heart already, what about somebody who has desperately, desperately done me an injustice? Forgive them. Forgive them. Listen, forgiveness does not establish relationship or trust. Okay? It's really important for you to know. Jesus forgave you before the foundation of the world. Okay? When you turned to him and said, I do, you're in a covenant relationship. Get it? So your forgiveness of someone else is your responsibility. But allowing trust, proximity, friendship, not required. Not required. Jesus didn't even demonstrate that. There were people that Jesus ate with, and there were people that Jesus ran from. Okay? And you are permitted to be like your father in heaven who runs from people. <laughs> but here's the deal. You should, you should have these conversations. You should make these decisions. We're in covenant relationship with people, and the people that we're in covenant relationship with, we, they know that we're, we're in covenant relationship with them. You don't have to have the talk, but, I mean, it's just it's unspoken. Yep. And there's some people that I will run from. <laughs> Forgiveness does, doesn't establish trust. It doesn't establish relationship. As a matter of fact, I'll give you the foundations for understanding the word Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a compound Greek word, apo, which means away from, emi, who I am. So if you forgive someone, you're simply willing to be able to discern them apart from what they've done. Yep, you're just simply able to see them apart from what they've done. 
Now, you can do that the, to the entire planet and not have to be in covenant relationship with the entire planet. So your offender simply becomes somebody that you've forgiven that you don't trust and aren't in relationship with. Okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. Trust and relationship are wildly important in the kingdom. Shanda and I only lead with people that we trust. Yeah, it's stupid to lead with people that you don't trust. Oh, I said stupid. <laughs> Shannon told me this morning to stop saying stupid. That's three times. I'm sorry. <laughs> now I just want to keep saying it. <laughs> I wouldn't have coveted had you told me not to covet. <laughs> okay. So, I'm almost done. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. That'll be the last thing we talk about because I just want to use this to demonstrate everything that we've talked about so far. Okay, so there is a move. Ooh. Hot wife text me. Uh -oh. <laughs> Oof. That's a good question. Should I answer it? Okay. Is peace an indicator that I've forgiven? the question, right? No, it's not. Okay. Love is patient. It's kind. It's long-suffering. All of these are choices. They're not feelings. Okay? So your feelings don't have to be in line for you to be obedient. Right? I believe that you have, if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you will not find peace. But just because you've forgiven and you still don't have peace doesn't mean you haven't forgiven. Good? Excellent. Okay. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. I'm going to bring all of this kind of to, to make sense right now. But it says, Therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to... Does everybody see what the word is? Keep, my, my translation says preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Okay, so here's the deal. Everything in the kingdom is not creating something. It's entering into that which God has already created. Okay, so contrary to most church um, endeavors, they're trying to create unity. I'm going to be honest. When you try to create unity, all you do is water down your doctrines until you have nothing to say to one another and you can just have pizza without arguing. Right? When it comes to unity, you have to leave doctrine out of it because we don't gather around agreement, we gather around family. Okay? None of us, not even our leaders share the same doctrinal stance. We gather around family. So there is a unity that needs created in the natural, and that's always going to be through striving. But there is a unity that exists in the spirit that simply needs preserved. That means the way that we interact and see one another in the kingdom simply needs preserved by the way we feel for one another in the soul realm and preserved in the way that we see one another in the natural. So I see you as I know you in the spirit. Does that make sense? It's that simple. So when it comes to relationships, the people that you're in covenant relationship with, you're, you're agreeing to always discern them. As a matter of fact, you have the responsibility to discern the entire body of Christ. And then you have the responsibility to be able to determine what kind of relationships you're in. Jesus had one. He had three. He had 12. He had multitudes. He was fine with it. There were people's calls that Jesus wouldn't answer. You okay with it? But then if it was Peter, James, or John, on it, right? He, he had organized his life in a way that would bear fruit in his metron. That's how he works. That's how he works. Would you guys stand with me real quick? Miss Becker, would you join me up here? Okay, last thing I'll say. How many of you ever heard of the golden rule? Yep, the golden rule's kind of misleading. The reason it's kind of misleading is because it was actually a trick question. Somebody asked Jesus, what is, how did he say that? Mm. 
what's the greatest of all the law and the prophets? Okay, that's the question they asked. The system that Jesus was coming to fulfill, they asked what the greatest thing about that old system was. And they said, love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, and soul, or something like that. And love your neighbor as yourself. Woo! She's on it. Okay, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, get honest, okay? If you are a sensual person, if you loved your neighbor as yourself, you'd go to jail. If you're judging according to appearance, most of you don't like yourself that much. So God no longer gives you the commission to love someone as you love yourself. He says now, a new commandment I give to you because the old one expired. He said, upon this hangs all the law and the prophets, and I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So it's, it's useless. But he said, a new commandment I give you. It's the only time Jesus used the term commandment. He says, love one another as I have loved you. So now love becomes transcendent and not reciprocal. Amen. Yep. So your love for someone else is not dependent on what you get from them, what you see in them. Your love for someone else is dependent on what you've received from him. Right? It can't fail. It can't fail, right? Is that in the Bible somewhere? The whole time that Paul is talking about spiritual gifts and how you can function in spiritual gifts and still be <sighs> You can function in spiritual gifts and still <sighs> fall short. Yep, be annoying, a clanging symbol. Yep, you can do all of those things and still function in spiritual gifts. But he says this, love never fails. Yep, and he's not talking about the specific type of love that you and I use to get what we need. He's talking about the love that he loved us with. Yep, so love is no longer reciprocated, it's transcendent. It comes from above and goes out from you like a river of living water. Yep, it's good news, right? Okay, all I wanted to do today was get practical about heaven on earth. The reality is people really don't care outside this church how many dead people you raise. They don't. I mean, the dead people care. Yeah, they're pretty stoked. But we've seen thousands, no joke, thousands of physical healings in the last 10 years. And it hasn't filled our seats yet. But when people walk in our doors and they feel heaven on earth, they come back. Yep. Amen. The goal of Legacy Church from the beginning is for angels to get confused. They don't, they don't know if they're ascending or descending because what they're, what they're in when they descend is exactly what they came from. Yep, we want angels to get confused. Okay, so complete and total break. I'm bad at landing planes, ironically. I'm bad at landing planes. I'd like to invite the ministry team up. And I know we have a few needs from our friends from out of, uh, out of state that we just need to, to pray and minister over. So there is absolutely nothing formal about this moment, but we are a five-fold ministry church. That means apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists all, all carry impartation that it takes to bring you to completion. So if you need prayer for anything, physical healing, deliverance, anxiety, depression, fear, pain, whatever it might be, we're just going to take some time. As a matter of fact, this is the last time you hear me talk. If you need to go get your kids, you can go get your kids. If you don't have a, a, a need, you're more than welcome to leave. If I were you, I'd stay. Okay? You never know what God's going to do. Um, and we also are going to likely allow some of these people to get healed to testify. But is there anybody at this time that would just like to come have some of our ministry team pray for you? pray with you. This isn't admitting fault, failure, guilt, nothing. These guys can get rid of the things that you didn't need to know you needed to get rid of, and they can bring in promises that you didn't know were yours. Amen? All right. I'm going to pray over you all right now, and then we can just move about freely as we feel. Father, thank you so much for this incredible group of people right now. We anoint each and every one of these people to be able to minister as you on earth. In Jesus' name. One second. We do have a word here. I have three things. 
I saw. I saw someone with uh, gut issues. I don't know if it's leaky gut. That's a yucky word, but I mean, just belly issues. No matter what you eat or drink, it's just constant. I don't know if it's a pain in your belly. Also, the second thing I got was mouth pain. TMJ, I don't know if somebody is cracking or popping or something's going on, if it's a tooth. I, I actually don't know. I just heard the word mouth pain. And this is strange. Another word I got was the word family matters. Um, I'm not, like I said, I don't know what it means, but if you have issues with your mom or your dad or your sibling, if a divorce, adoption, custody issues, because if you look up family matters, that's what it kind of revolves around. So whatever that is, I know um, I heard something is cooking and God wants it to simmer down and cease from being hot. It said simmer. It won't be all at once, but it will cool. He said he wants you to choose cool. I don't know if it's a fight. I don't know. I don't know. If that's just me and my thinking. But those three things came. So if that's any of you, please come up and get prayer. Don't suffer. Don't suffer. We kind of want to keep track of you, too. Who's got the gut issues that needs prayer? Would you come up? Well, it's Jill. Okay. Okay. Um, mouth pain? If, if uh, mouth pain? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Yep, if anybody resonates with any of those things, come on up. If 